Jai Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Kunjavi Hari Jai Gopi Janavallava Hari Hari Canto 2, Chapter 5, The Cause of All Causes. This is text number 10. 
Natritam Tavatat Chapi Yatamam Prabhavisibo Avigyayam Param Bata Mata Etavatvam Yatohime Naritam Tavatat Chapi Yatamam Prabhavisibo Avigyayam Param Mata Tavatvam yatohime Nanritam tavatat chapi Yatamam prabhavisibo Avigyayam prambata Etavatvam yatahime Anyone else? Na, Na. not Na. unwritten, false, tava, of yours, tat, that, cha, also, api, as you have stated, yada, in the matter of, mum, of myself, Baba Visi, as you describe, Bo, O my son, Avigyaya, without knowing, Param, the Supreme, Mata, beyond myself, Etava, all that you have spoken, Twam, yourself, Yata, for the reason of he certainly may about me. Hmm. So Lord Brahma is responding to the glorification he received from Narada Muni, who is both a great soul and at the same time his uh, best of all of the ten sons. Purport. No, translation. Whatever you have spoken about me is not false, because unless and until one is aware of the personality of Godhead, who is the ultimate truth beyond me, 
One is sure to be illusioned by observing my powerful activities. I'll read it again. Whatever you have spoken about me is not false, because unless and until one is aware of the personality of Godhead, who is the ultimate truth beyond me, one is sure to be illusioned by observing my powerful activities. So what is Brahma saying here? He's saying that these powerful activities of mine are simply due to the personality of Godhead. <laughs> Purport. The frog in the well logic illustrates that a frog residing in the atmosphere and boundary of a well cannot imagine the length and breadth of the gigantic ocean. Such a frog, when informed of the gigantic length and breadth of the ocean, first of all does not believe that there is such an ocean. And someone assures him that factually there is such a thing the frog then begins to measure it by imagination by means of pumping its belly as far as possible with the result that the tiny abdomen of the frog bursts and the poor frog dies. <laughs> Without any experience of the actual ocean. It's quite humorous. <laughs> Similarly, the material scientists also want to challenge the inconceivable potency of the Lord by measuring him with their frog-like brains and their scientific achievements. But at the end, they simply die unsuccessfully like the frog. <laughs> Sometimes, a materially powerful man is accepted as God or the incarnation of God without any knowledge of the factual God. Such material assessment may be gradually extended and attempt may reach to the highest limits of Brahmaji who is the topmost living being within the universe and has a duration of life unimaginable to the material scientists. As we get information from the most authentic book of knowledge, the Bhagavad Gita, from verse 817, Brahmaji's Brahma one's day and night is calculated to be some hundreds of thousands of years of our planet. This long duration of life may not be believed by the frog in the well. The persons who have a realization of truth mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita accept the existence of a great personality who creates the variegatedness of the complete universe. It is not understood from the revealed scriptures that the Brahmaji of this universe is younger than all the Brahmins and charge and charge of the many, many universes beyond this, but none of them can be equal to the personality of Godhead. Nardaji is one of the liberated souls, and after his liberation he was known as Narada. Otherwise, before his liberation, he was simply a son of a maidservant. The question may be asked why Nardaji was not aware of the Supreme Lord and why he misconceived Brahmaji to be the Supreme Lord, although factually he was not. A liberated soul is not bewildered by such a mistaken idea. So why did Naraji ask all these questions like an ordinary man that has a poor fund of knowledge? There was such bewilderment in Arjuna also, although he is eternally the association of the associate of the Lord. Such bewilderment in Arjun or Narada takes the place by the will of the Lord so that others, that is, non-liberated persons, may realize the real truth of the knowledge of the Lord. The doubt arising in the mind of Narada about Brahman becomes a, le a powerful the doubt arising in the mind of Narada about Brahmaji becoming all-powerful is a lesson for the frogs in the well, for they may not be bewildered in misconceiving the identity of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even by comparison to a personality like Brahma, what to speak of ordinary men who falsely pose themselves as God or as an incarnation of God. The Supreme Lord is always the Supreme, as we have tried to establish many times in these purport, no living being up to the standard of Brahma can claim to be one with the Lord. 
One should not be misled when people worship a great man as God after his death as a matter of hero worship. There are many good kings like Lord Ramachandra, the king of Ayodhya, but none of them are mentioned as God in the revealed scriptures. To be a good king is not necessary the qualification for being Lord Rama, but to be a great person like Krishna is the qualification for being the personality of Godhead. If we scrutinize the characters who took part in the battle of Kurukshetra, we find that Maharaj Yudhisthira was no less a pious king than Lord Ramachandra. And by character study, Maharaj Yudhisthira was a better moralist than Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna asked Maharaj Yudhisthira to lie, but Maharaj Yudhisthira protested. But, does that, but that does not mean that Maharaj Yudhisthira could be equal to Lord Ramachandra or Lord Krishna. The great authorities have estimated Maharaj Yudhisthira to be a pious man, but they have accepted Lord Ram or Krishna as the personality of Godhead. The Lord is therefore a different identity in all circumstances and no idea of anthropo anthropomorphism can be applied to him. The Lord is always the Lord and a common living entity can never be equal to him. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine, Vanchakalpa Taru Vistya Kripa Sindhu Bevacha, Patitanam Bhavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Rindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nitya Nitya Nam Chaitan is Chaitan Nam Eku Bahura Viradati Kama. It's mentioned in the um, Upanishads that there is one Nitya and everyone else is Nitya Nam. Mm -hmm. And Eko Bahunam Viradati Kaman is only one, and he maintains all the many others. And that one is described by the great souls who are well versed in the scriptures and who also, and is also mentioned by the Lord Himself that there is no one greater than Him. <laughs> and uh, Sometimes, and we see it here, that a great personality will be given a lot of glorification. That even happens in the secular realm when something, someone does something outstandingly glorious in terms of material estimations. They get some credit for that. And they're, they're given a lot of you know, respect and honor. You see, if you go to many countries around the world, it's very popular most in India. You find there's statues of, you know, soldiers, there's statues of great statesmen, statesmen, persons who have done something for the country and they make a statue. Of course, they don't really take care of it so much, but that's another thing. But they make these statues just to remind people that who are some of the great personalities that contributed to the country. And but there when you compare when you compare it to the personality of Godhead, uh, they, they look like just like a firefly in relationship to the, the sun. And that's that's illustrated by Brahmaji when Brahmaji tried to show his power in front of Lord Sri Krishna by uh, playing a trick on Krishna. 
uh, the cowherd boys and calves and Krishna were all taking lunch on the banks of the river and having a very transcendentally happy time as Krishna does when he plays with his friends, they enjoy it in different ways, that friendship mood. And uh, they talk, they joke, they exchange food, and sometimes they even make fun of each other. <laughs> it goes on as transcendental pleasure. And uh, Brahma, seeing all this, he was thinking, who is this person? <laughs> Of course, that same person had killed a big demon just before that, so Brahman wanted to show, test him and just see who, who this personality is. And so he exhibited his power, and he was able, apparently. Of course, there are some different opinions of whether he was actually able to take away the cowherd boys and the calves. But in one sense, that he did, and in order to play out this Leela, in another sense, he couldn't do it because they are, you know, eternal associates of the Lord and they cannot be touched by the material energy in any sense. But for the sake of Leela, apparently he stole these boys and put them in a cave just to prove that he is, uh, you know, powerful and just to test the power of Krishna. But Krishna not only showed Brahma that he was a fool, but he showed him he was not only a fool, but a big fool. <laughs> he expanded himself again to the calves and cowherd boys in such a way that there was no difference between each and every boy all the way down to their personal personality traits. They were exactly the same in all respects. And then he manifested another set of cowherd boys and calves in the form of the Vishnu forms. He, changed, he manifested himself and he expanded himself as these cowherd boys and calves and then he transformed himself, he transformed all of those boys and calves into Vishnu forms just to show that's me. <laughs> that's them but it's also me. So um, this particular Leela, Brahma Mohan Leela, that's how it's described as the bewilderment of Lord Brahma. And we see, we hear from this, and it's illustrated by the glorification that's coming from a great soul, Sri Narada, how powerful and great Lord Brahma is. But Brahma wants to clear, clear, clear the air and make it to let him know that Whatever greatness or powerful power I do have, and you're right, he acknowledges the eulogies and the glorifications, but it's not as glorious as the personality of God, in, and whatever I have, it's simply his, his power coming through me, that's all. Very uh, important lesson to learn in spiritual life. And, uh, uh, it says that the living entity gets bewildered thinking that they actually do things. What is that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Prakriti kriyamanani guni karmani sarvasya ahankara bimudatma kartaham iti manyate. Karta means doer. One thinks they're the doer. But actually they're simply working on this principle of desire and it's facilitated by the external environment and by the presence of the super soul. So the living entity actually is always surrounded by uh, what we say deficiencies. But when they do something that looks natural or normal or even great, it's the potency of the Lord that is working through them. That's all. <laughs> And when we know that, there's no question of pride. And that's what happens when somebody becomes glorious or great. We see the example of, you know, uh, Indradev. Uh, he was thwarted in getting his worship, so much so by Krishna, who diverted the attention away from Indra and saying, you know, we're cowherd men. And we depend on the agricultural land and the cows and 
like that. And so, you know, it's going to rain anyway, so don't worry about it. We don't have to worship this king of heaven, Indra. Let's just worship the land, the cows, and, and then that is actually proper worship. And of course, Nar Nanda Maharaj, after hearing that and discussing it with Krishna, was finally yeah, convinced that what Krishna was saying was the best. But Indra wasn't. <laughs> Andrew was thinking, what is he doing, you know? This is my worship. Whew. You know, you think a person like that would be in such knowledge of their position because they're actually devotees also. Devas are devotees, but they're sakama devotees. That means they have material desires, but they're still very powerful and they have great, they have great responsibilities. But maybe we can say, and actually this is the tendency that when one becomes known as powerful or has that position, there's an element of pride that can come in. And when pride comes in, it sort of it kind of erases everything good. Because pride is by nature false. Is, well, sometimes the devotees ask, is there any kind of spiritual pride? Yes, I'm proud that I have somehow or other received the mercy of my spiritual master, and therefore I have become fortunate. <laughs> that kind of pride is transcendental because it doesn't give yourself the credit. It gives you the, the mercy. The credit goes to the Lord or the, the Lord's pure devotee. But you take pride in the fact that you somehow or other were fortunate enough to receive that mercy. Therefore, you don't give credit to yourself. <laughs> so that's transcendental pride, and that's proper. But anything else, here we see how, I mean, Narada Muni, you would think, whoa, Brahmaji is getting glorified by Narada Muni. I mean, what better person could be in a position to give glorification than Sri Narada? He's a transcendental personality, and he's very close to the Supreme Lord. But Brahma sets the state, and he's actually saying, well, actually, uh, it's not me. <laughs> it's the Supreme Person, Krishna himself, like that. And Prabhupada goes on to describe how people who are great sometimes like to align themselves with even greater people in order to get more acclaim or credit for their greatness. So sometimes you see that a great person, even in a material sense, will be called Bhagavan. <laughs> and Bhagavan refers to that person who is full in all six opulences. Doesn't apply to the conditioned souls. But you'll see that sometimes a person will, say, will refer to or you would see even the, the, the Mayavadis, they address themselves as Narayan. Om Namo Narayan. When they see each other, they, they glorify each other as being Narayan. And they, off, they kind of give each other credit for being Narayan. So many Narayans. Which one is the real one? So this is the nature of the conditioned soul's uh, mentality and then Prabhupada said also and he gives this very instructive point he says the last snare of Maya is to think you're a god or an incarnation of God in other words you make so much advancement in spiritual life and you also perform so many outstanding achievements as you make advancement and you're glorified for that and then that tendency is to take credit and sometimes when that credit doesn't get shut down, one starts to think, hmm, yeah, that's me. I just found out I'm an incarnation. <laughs> maybe, not a, maybe not a big one, but I'm an incarnation. <laughs> this happens, and I, could, I don't want to name any names, but it's happened in ISKCON. <laughs> there are people who think that they're actually you know, may, maybe not a big, in, like maybe just a Shaktivesha avatar. So. <laughs> Indirect, <laughs> not direct. 
So this is what too much, uh, what we say, what is it where too much, too much uh, isolation from the association of peers can actually cause, because when you're in dissociation of peers, even if you have done so many wonderful things, you're checked <laughs> by that association. Yeah, because they all know they don't see it in the same way. So it's very important to always take association with peers because they help us to reflect what is our actual position. Now we are also servant. We may be able to do good things, but we also, as Krishna, what Krishna says, you know, rasoham apsukuntiya, prabhaspi sasyasuriya, pranava sarva vedishu, sabdike purusham nishu. So that last line indicates that Krishna says, I am the ability in all living beings. <laughs> and he also says, sarvasya jaham ridisani misto, matat smirta jnanam apohanam cha that I give knowledge, I give remembrance, and I can also give forgetfulness accordingly. So you'll find throughout the scriptures, Krishna makes the point that, you know, whatever you see is great, and then he illustrates that in the entire 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where he's showing all the great things, it's being mentioned, all the great things, and he says, that's me. <laughs> So some people say, wow, Krishna is proud. Well, yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> He's allowed to do that <laughs> because he is great. <laughs> There's no one greater than him. But his pride doesn't cause him to exploit or, or to push down others by that pride. His pride is, is just to help us understand his position, that's all. <laughs> And when we understand his position, then we know that there is no better way to worship than to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is Sarvakarna Karnam, cause of all causes. Like that. So we hear here that there are many persons surreptitiously like to adopt these false positions of greatness. And those who hear about them, this is an also an in interesting point that's being mentioned here, that those who hear about them, they also cannot understand, or even if they try to understand, they can't understand. And here it refers to, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, Prabhupada likes to use this analogy of the frog in the well, and it's a perfect analogy. Because the frog's uh, geographical uh, understanding is very limited. All he knows is his well. <laughs> and so when he's, something is told to him outside of that that's bigger, he tries to imagine it in respect to his own position. We also do that. <laughs> Maybe not in the same way, but we also do that. Because it says, chintya beta beta tattva, that the absolute truth is inconceivable. So any form of imagination, even by those who have great intelligence, falls short. It's actually, it's actually pretentious and it looks ridiculous. <laughs> it actually looks ridiculous to try to understand the, the absolute truth through one's own abilities. It's, it's, it's foolish. And you see that all the time. If you talk to different people, they all have some conception of what is God. And they think their conception is right. They, their conception may come by way of their own independent studies or some experience or whatever. But the, the, the example that is given is that you have a blind man and you have a, an elephant. So the blind man, he goes to different places on the elephant. When he grabs the tail, he says, well, the elephant's like a rope. When he grabs the trunk, the elephant's like a column. No, when he, the elephant's like a... When he grabs his leg, the elephant's like a column. When he feels its side, the elephant's like a mountain. So wherever he touches, he gets his uh, different understanding of the elephant because he's blind. <laughs> So the conditioned soul are also blind to the reality of 
the absolute truth. Therefore, you have to hear from authority. This is the only way you can understand. Knowledge is given from by higher third, evam parampara prakta, evam rajasayo vidu. And through the systematic system of acharyas that go all the way back to Krishna, that knowledge, without being changed, comes down in its pure and original form. And when we accept it and try to understand it by applying it in devotional service, gradually we get more and more realization of the nature of the absolute truth. And as that increases, our attraction for Krishna increases more. And as our attraction for Krishna, Krishna increases more, then our attachment also increases. And as that increases even more, then we start developing uh, affection for Krishna, leading all the way up to prema, love for Krishna. So we have to hear from great souls. This is the actual process regularly. And it's not something you do. It's like eating. It's like we have, just like we eat every day. And sometimes more than once a day, twice, sometimes three times a day. It's called nourishment, necessary nourishment for the body. So there is also nourishment for the soul. And if the soul doesn't get its regular nourishment, it dries up. <laughs> Just like the body will also feel some deficiency if it's not given proper nourishment. So the soul needs to be nourished by hearing regularly from the great souls about the absolute truth. And then everything becomes nice and clear. And then there's no and then when we hear something that is contrary, we can also immediately show that, ah, oh, this is not correct. <laughs> because as we mentioned, everyone has their opinion <laughs> of what is the nature of the absolute truth. So Narada, yeah, he, it's also mentioned here, how could Narada be wrong? Such a great soul. And then Prabhupada uses the comparative analogy of Arjun who was also asking questions like an ordinary person before he actually surrendered to Krishna. But both were setting the stage for, for the speaking of higher knowledge. We also have the example of uh, Maharaj Pariksit. He couldn't somehow rather be overcome by thirst, but it apparently he was. And then he apparently he acted in a way that was contrary to his character. And he apparently committed offense to a, you know, a sage by putting a garland around him, which was actually a dead snake. <laughs> and so you'll see there are incidents within the Shastras that help to bring out more and more knowledge. And it's done by great souls. The conditioned souls cannot be put in that situation because they won't be able to act in such a way as to bring out the message that needs to be brought out. So that's why the Lord chooses or those persons, great souls are done because when they do it, that knowledge is perfect. <laughs> and that knowledge is perfect. Yeah. So when we understand that, then we get perfect, when we get perfect knowledge and perfect knowledge, uh, as it says, Yasya Devi Prada Bhaktir Yata Devi Tata Guru Tasyaiva Kartitam Yata Yat Yata what is the last line? Prakasanatma Mahatmanaha. Yeah, by hearing by having complete faith in the words of the spiritual master and the Lord, not just one but both then all the knowledge and all the scriptures become automatically revealed within the heart of such a, such a personality who has have had the, the faith. But that faith develops by hearing. We have to hear regularly. It's not that it's just incidental hearing or whenever I have time hearing. <laughs> it's regularly. I'm saying that because I'm seeing myself needing to hear more. <laughs> when I find myself somehow becoming more involved with doing service, sometimes we push the hearing process a little bit out because we think, oh, the service has to be done. And then the hearing and chanting, 
especially the reading of the scriptures. But Prabhupada makes the point in, in the scriptures of self, in the very end of the Madhya Lila, he explains by using one particular verse that if the devotees in this ISKCON society do not read all the books that have been published, and at that time Prabhupada mentions four, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and Nectar of Devotion. If they do not read all these, then they will eventually become weak in their spiritual life and then return to eating and sleeping. And then the, the opportunity for transcendental life will be lost. That's in the purport. So it's important that we read and hear regularly these scriptures. Even if we don't have an inclination towards that type of uh, activity, still by the hearing process it's purified. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes Prabhupada would be with his uh, disciples and there'd be, he'd be in India and the people there would be Hindu, you know, Indian speaker. They would speak Hindi. So sometimes Prabhupada would speak Hindi and his disciples would be there. And uh, sometimes they would want to get up and go and Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, no, sit down and listen. He said, the sound vibration is purifying, even if you don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. When pure, pure knowledge is spoken by a pure person, even if you don't understand it, it's... It has a transforming effect to the soul. It awakens bhakti within the soul just by the process of hearing. So these are some important principles that we can take with us from this particular verse and purport, especially seeing how you know, great personalities who are seen by being great all get their all get their greatness from the source of all greatness, the Lord Himself. Okay, so I'll stop. See if there's any comments or questions. Yes, Hari Guru Prabhu. Yeah. Nice kirtan that was. Hari Krishna. Um, on that last point, I just spoke to one old friend, well, a new friend in my he said. He went to a lecture in Leicester Temple in the, in the 90s and he didn't speak English, he was Spanish. Hmm. He didn't speak hardly any English and he saw Tribhuvanath give a lecture and from that lecture he became convinced but he didn't understand one word. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect example, yeah. And of course Tribhuvanath when he spoke, he captured everybody's attention. <laughs> And he, he spoke from the heart, and that was the point. When you speak from the heart, it has a powerful effect. I'll give you a reverse example in my life. I was preaching in Poland, and I was in one particular city I had gone for the first time, and it was a pretty large group of people. Oh, it was more, of a, more than 100. It was just a, it was a nam hot program. And so at the end, uh, we called for questions. And I had a translator there also. So one man gets up and he starts really, and in a very emotional expression, starts talking. And, uh, you know, I don't know anything about Poland, you know. <laughs> I know one word in Poland, that's called zloty, and that means money, right? <laughs> that's the only... Because when I was on a train one time, I was sitting on the train and I, the conductor came up to me and said, zloty, zloty, zloty. And then I found out later he wanted money. <laughs> so that's the only word I ever remember in Poland. <laughs> but anyway, Polish. And so I'm listening to this man speak in, in a very emotional way in his native language. And you know, it actually it had an effect on me. I almost knew what he was saying because he was speaking really from the heart. And I could un understand that this person was really happy that he had come in contact with Krishna consciousness. And when the translator translated, that was the actual translation. 
that he was actually feeling so fortunate that he had actually had a chance to come to this process. And he had wasted his previous years in his life doing things that were, by his estimation, useless. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. And so yeah, language has its limitations. <laughs> Thank you, that's a nice point. Anyone else? Yes, Prabhu, in the corner there. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, in regard to hearing, I mean, um, we keep hearing and hearing every day for years and years and years. So I don't know how that knowledge actually acts. I mean, like, uh, what stays in us? And, and so, is that just like a daily nourishment, that's it? Or, or perhaps after hearing, we have to contemplate and analyze and... I don't know how this applied to our life, actually. What is, how what does is hearing is purifying? Like, I mean, I don't see much uh, change with me in the last you're 20 years. You're still here. I'm here, yeah. So, so is, that, is that means... <laughs> <laughs> if you've been here 20 some years... It's like a daily hearing, like, it's like a good. daily <laughs> prasadam or something. Like, just, just kind of keep you here, or how is that? It's transformative, but there is also a, a quality that is required for hearing. And if you apply these qualities in the process of hearing, you can accelerate the benefit of hearing. And the quality is, one, faith in the speaker, two, humility, three, destroying the faults of the mind. That means when the mind wanders this way and that way, bring it back to the hearing process. These are the three qualities mentioned in Padma Purana. One has to have faith that the speaker is speaking correctly. And two, one should not try to filter what is being said through one's own you know, intelligence. One should hear submissively. And then when the mind wanders, bring it back to the sound. And the fourth principle, which is a result of the following the other three, is two things happen. One, one or two things happen, or you get both. You get realization on what you heard. You start to realize, oh yes, what is, what is being said, you start to understand, yes, it's correct. And in other words, lights go off, you know. And the other uh, aspect is, if you don't get realization, questions. So if you don't get realizations or questions, you're not hearing. <laughs> That's the fact. There's no other, there's another, there's no third point to that. And so we have to practice that process of hearing in that, in that consciousness regularly. And the hearing process may take longer or shorter depending on the person also. And sometimes we're eager to hear. And sometimes we're eager to hear from certain pe persons and our eagerness is peaked when we hear from certain persons and when we hear from others we just we go through the process but that's you can always get something from any lecture that's being given if you look for if you have that mood it doesn't matter even if a child is given a class you'll learn something <laughs> really so just keep going <laughs> But I can say, I can say, I know devotees feel like, well, you know, I'm not making any advance, but that's their humility. Um, when we actually see and we carefully evaluate where I was last year and where I am today, you'll see there is a qualitative change in our life. If you actually observe objectively, you'll see, yeah. Is that true, uh, Sutapa? And, yeah, and then there's a qualitative change as we go on. We see that. Yeah. Something about our character or our d devotion is increased like that. Question over there? Yes, uh, Prayojana. It's uh, with regard to something uh, when Gurumrad said for attentive um, listening. Attentive listening um, he, he described as basically that 
Each time we approach a class, we should say, what this is personally telling me about myself. Mm. And um, that actually, that there's a message personally here for me. Right. That um, uh, we should uh, appreciate it. If we aren't getting that and we're just looking for knowledge, yeah. you know, in other words, it's just um, repeating what's here, then uh, it's not attentive. Right, right. We'll go through to the next class and it's in the same attitude. So he, he says, treat it as a personal message. That's a very good point. Yeah. If we have that uh, mood of hearing, we'll gain something, obviously, a lot. I remember one time I went to a class with a very senior devotee and I sat in the back and I was thinking, I'm going to pick up some points I can use in my lectures. That was before the class. And as soon as he began the class, he said, now you shouldn't be here simply to get information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said that right at the beginning and then I, really, I realized, you know, this class is going to be really good. <laughs> Yeah, it happened to me, uh, so I, that knocked me off my false idea. <laughs> so yeah, it's not like you know, I'm going to get some information so I can tell somebody else about what I heard. Uh, it's more like, what can I learn that will help me in making progress in Krishna consciousness? And the second point to that part is that Krishna always empowers the speaker to say something that will be beneficial to each and every devotee. And many times you find that you have questions and then after you hear the, the class, the questions are answered in the class without even asking them. Yeah. That happens quite often. So yeah, that's a very um, important thing to understand that the class is for me. Yeah. Very nice point to make, yes. There's Adi Guru, and then we have one person in the back there also. Mm -hmm. I just remember you do, I just remembered when Uddhava, no, Vidura and Maitreya are speaking. Mm. Um, one of them says, or oh, your questions, it's Maitreya, says, your questions have made me remember my Lord Krishna. Or maybe it's Maitreya to Uddhava, I can't remember. Uh, your questions have made me remember my Lord. Yeah, it was, it was Maitreya who said that. Yeah, Because yeah. Vidura was asking the questions. Yeah. So the another aspect of the hearing and the questioning or the hearing is that we remember Krishna. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, 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 the, that's the, the, the perfect goal of hearing, is that you remember Krishna. And, uh, and you remember Krishna in different ways depending on what is being said. Yeah. I think I just read that just the other day. That just by the association of certain personalities, they help you remember Krishna. Yes, thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the class. Um, there's one question about uh, pride, which you mentioned. How can we really feel that Krishna is using us as an instrument and gain confidence from that? Like sometimes we say, oh yeah, this is because of Krishna, but we don't actually feel that. We don't actually, in our heart, give credit to Krishna. We say it externally, but we don't. How can we understand that what we're doing is actually the desire of Krishna? Yeah, and also Not necessarily. That, and also that any like kind of a ability or strength that we get in performing service is coming from Krishna. It doesn't matter whether you feel it or not, and it's true. <laughs> <laughs>
just just accept it. <laughs> and if you feel it, that's called special mercy. Realizations of what happens in Krishna consciousness or the philosophical teachings are all called special mercy. <laughs> but we go on by way of mercy. Special mercy is when you get realizations. <laughs> so that doesn't come always. But it's true, because it's actually, yeah. Well, Krishna says, I am the ability in all living beings. From me comes knowledge, remembrance, forgetfulness. In so many ways, Krishna speaks that actually that we are simply an instrument for his mercy. And so, And the more you take shelter of Krishna when you perform your activities, the more you can experience that. You can start to see, oh, how did I do that? <laughs> Must have been Krishna. <laughs> Sometimes we, we also say that. How oh, this came out s such ideally, I can't do that, it's Krishna. So the results, yeah. And Krishna says, you got to do your duty, but don't take credit for the results. Uh, you have a right to perform your duty, Never consider yourself the cause of the activities of your, and never, never be attached to not doing your duty. So you got to do your duty. You're not the cause of the result, and whether you like it or not, you got to do it. <laughs> In so many words. So yeah, all of these things are coming by way of the mercy of the Lord. But it's all based on our desire. So when we desire, Krishna puts things in motion through our desire. Either the material energy for the non-devotees and the spiritual energy for the devotees. He is that source of the energy, and but the energy works under his control. Therefore, he's actually doing it through the energies. <laughs> yes, Sutapa. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for the class. I just have a question about, uh, you mentioned about the slokas, that they, if one listens from the spiritual master, that uh, they will be revealed within the heart. Uh, I was just trying to understand this. Oh, that it, verse, yeah. Yes. That, that one is, you just got to accept it as it is. <laughs> Again, it's an experience. It's not something you can analytically understand. If you have complete faith, your complete faith is not something, you know, static. It's your devotion in action. When you have complete faith in the, in the words of the spiritual master and the Lord, then the conclusion is that that faith awakens within you transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge exists within the soul or itself. And it's actually when faith is applied to all, all of our activities, that faith, that application of that faith in practice awakens that, that knowledge. But if it's not that you have complete faith and you don't do anything. You have to, you have to apply that faith in your day-to-day -day service. Prabhupada used to say, my spiritual master is wrong, but he's right. That's complete faith. <laughs> I may not understand what he's saying, but still, I have complete faith in him. And whatever he says, it's right. So that's an, that's, an, that's an example of faith that is not simply based on knowledge, but simply faith in that person, knowing that person is qualified spiritual master, the pure devotee. 
So we all, when Prabhupada was here, we all had faith that whatever Prabhupada did and said was perfect. And he proved it by the way he, he, he spoke and the way he dealt with each and every devotee. So, yeah, so that faith takes develop, time to develop. But once it develops, then it, br it brings transcendental knowledge automatically. That knowledge is not coming from outside of you, it's already inside. It's just being revealed. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I'm sorry, Srimad Bhagavatam, what is that verse? Um, Srinvata Svakata Krishna Purnya Shravana Kirtanaha Ridyanto Stoa Bhadrani Vidyanoti Husit Sihit Satam that one develops an eagerness to hear simply by serving great souls. And when that eagerness to hear becomes regular, Krishna within the heart cleanses material desires from the heart. So he's doing the cleaning process. And we're, we're, our process is to hear and to serve. You know. And Krishna cleans. He's taking away all of our material coverings. Does that help? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Maharaj. Yeah. Sutapa Prabhu. I was just thinking, Maharaj, on Karan's point about how we understand that Krishna is doing everything. Sometimes uh, it's easier to realize that when you're being disempowered or when you fail. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, before that, I, I'm doing it. And then when it doesn't work, it's Krishna's fault. Yeah. <laughs> Krishna, what happened? <laughs> I was thinking that failure. I was just thinking that type of failure is like, it's actually a beautiful gift to the Krishna. Because it's like, it's like when we're. I needed to hear that today. I'm struggling with one thing. Well, I'm trying to do it, but I can't do it. So now I have to remember what you said. <laughs> that I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Chris can make it happen or not make it happen. And we have to have understanding from both sides. Yeah. Why is it not happening? I've done it before, now I can't do it somehow. What's missing? Is it my faith? Is my is it my um, is it my uh, desire is not strong enough? Oh, that's that's a question we should always be asking because the whole process of life is a learning process. <laughs> So anything, everyone, any aspect of life, you're always trying to learn, and you take what you learn and and and, and you apply it. So life is is about learning. You, you get up in the morning, you think, what can I learn today? That would be something to meditate on. What 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 not? What can I learn? What should I learn today? That's even better. Oh, that's more important. What should I learn? Or what should I change? Yeah, thank you. Question? Hi, Krishna. Um, thank you for your class. Um, on the point about everything as um, one hears as a personal message for their improvement, um, and even further than that, like seeing every situation as a personal lesson or personal um, kind of uh, situation from Krishna like that. Um, how can I do this with intelligence um, and not overanalyze everything um, that I experience or that I hear? Because um, often it can be, you can get in a cycle of thinking, like you're trying to understand what... 
analyze how to do the service. That's all you have to do. There's your analysis. How to think how best to do the service. And then you don't have to analyze whether it's what's happening or not happening. Analyze how to do the service or use your intelligence. In that way, and that you won't focus on that other aspect. <laughs> because too much analysis makes you paralysis. Yeah. 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 Prabhupada gives many examples of that. By over analyzing things you you become what we say inefficient. Think how best you can do the service. Apply the principles. What am I not doing? What am what am I doing that I should not be doing? No. Yeah. So there's the there, you don't have to give up the idea of analysis, but just apply it to the service. That's all. Okay, is there anything else? Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm.